Walter Sanders. My name is Sergio Hernandez. And I'm Chris Kuli. Uh, we're the board of trustees. Uh, our mentor is Freddy Chu. Our advisor is Professor Sabritz in Nantu. And our faculty advisor is Professor Adam Nassim. Um, the roles of Pico Pico is that if I use Pico's satellite, um, basically we're competing for NASA's concept competition, which um, in FIU we've competed before, but we haven't been able to achieve a <coughs> higher position to be able to get launched. Um, the first three positions get launched and get to orbit with, with a function of the satellite. Um, the concept competition started in 2004, and it's only for Florida universities. The good side is that it could be is aerospace experience to students. Um, the mission objective is mainly focused on the weather conditions. Um, we're going to have sensors and cameras inside the satellite to be able to predict storms, um, have um, hazard detections such as like fires within forests. Um, we also, through the cameras, we're going to be able to analyze the pictures and determine sea level rises. Um, also, it's a global impact because it can work anywhere around the world, and it's not only for the certain Place. Um, the requirements for the competition and main, are mainly on the structure. Um, we have a, 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 a parameter of 10 by 10 on the base centimeters by a high of 30 centimeters. So our, our space is very limited. The maximum weight that we can put, um, including solar panels, cameras, sensors, and batteries, is 4 kilograms. So that's what we, what we compete with. And the, mission, the minimum mission life is 6 months, that everything has to be um, functional. Um, our altitude for us, we set it at 600. We adjust the different lenses and, and cameras in order to have a uh, clear result. Um, on, on, the, on the satellite design, we, we use the aluminum material, the 661T, because it's very durable and light in weight. Um, we arrange, since we have like different components and very tight space, we have to manage and arrange it within the satellite. Nothing can go outside, everything is supposed to be inside and functional. Um, the error margin that we have for the structure, it's about 0.5 millimeters, so everything has to be um, cut in precisely and, and foiled. Um, since the satellite is going to be subjected to extreme conditions, we, we conducted thermal analysis. Um, we used two different types of um, um, uh, sorry, um, mat um, insulation material, the styrofoam and aerogel. Since they have like a, a very low conductivity, we mainly use the aerogel, which was surrounded um, on the outside of the satellite, and we managed to achieve the, the correct temperatures that we needed for the sensors and cameras to work correctly. Um, we also perform unilateral testing since we're going to be launched, we're going to be subjected to some force, which is about 40 pounds of torque. On this, on this test, we went all the way to 550, and we didn't have much deflection of the structure. So we successfully managed to do the welding, and everything was within the parameters. As a prototype, we, we're designing that in the future, we're going to rearrange the components inside for a better um, structural balance. So as we can see here, this is the assembling of the initial satellite that we have here. On the left, we see most of it empty inside. We have the styrofoam as Walter was talking about. And as we go on until the end, we have all the internal components, which include the batteries up here. It includes voltmeters, because we have uh, two Beagle boards, one Arduino that's part of the communication to make sure that the temperature sensors work, the DHT sensors work, and everything is functioning. On this outer layer, if you see here, there's aluminum tape, and in between the aluminum tape and the satellite is an aerogel insulation layer. We wanted to make this and test it and make sure that all the components work before adding other subsystems. For example, we have an optical design. So here in the diagram, we see a basic image of you know, lights, objective lens, images. On the left, we have the nomenclature explaining the diagram. So we have here on the left, the height of the object. For us, our mission initially was to capture 25 kilometers uh, in an image from 600 kilometers above the Earth. So the satellite's gonna be 600 kilometers above the Earth, and when we take a picture, we're gonna be able to see 25 kilometers height in the entire image. So we had to do some calculations behind it to make sure we have the correct focal length. Here we have the formulas necessary. 
the top one is the magnification. Uh, moving variables around, we can find Q. And we need Q to find F, the focal length, which is going to be the distance between the image sensor and the objective lens. So here in the top left, we have a 0.3 megapixel DTL camera, a 14 megapixel image sensor, and a thermal image sensor. Our initial design gave us a focal length of about 152 millimeters. Our current design right now, as we can see here, is 250 millimeters. The optics chosen was uh, Edwin Optics. The reason why we chose this specific one is because we chose the VIS and IR one in order to be able to see things that our eyes can see as well. Since we're gonna be 600 kilometers above the Earth and we're in space, we wanna see some other infrared rays as well. So our lens has a special coating on it that lets us see the, what we see and other infrared rays. Every image sensor is going to be using the same optical lens. So this is the prototype that we made to make sure that we got proper images. And it's a basic PVC pipe. This is strictly for testing. Uh, the objective lens here at the end, and we have cardboard inside to prevent uh, light from reflecting. You know, it's white PVC, so any light that comes in can easily reflect and damage the image. This is the testing that we did in a lab. In this image here, this is without zoom at all. If you were to zoom into the image, you would clearly see the NASA logo. And we also must remember that every camera that we see already has an image sensor and an optical design to it. This was just strictly to make sure that the image is clear. Our design is going to have an image sensor and this optical design. So the image sensor is going to be directly behind this optical, the optics here. So with that being said, the image sensors, we have the results with a 0.3 megapixel image sensor. We would have a resolution of 22 meters with a 14 megapixel image sensor, a resolution of 3 meters. With a thermal image sensor, we're going to have a resolution of 28 meters. Another system that was important to add to the satellite was an attitude control system. So attitude control basically allows you to adjust and orient the satellite while it's in orbit as needed. What we decided to do was implement a three-axis orthogonal magnet worker as our actuator. And the way this magnet worker works is by having a magnetic rod with a coil wrapped around it. If you send a pulse of current through that coil, it'll create a magnetic field. And that magnetic field will in turn interact with the Earth's magnetic field, which would cause the which would cause shifting in motion. Um, to design this, we needed to set our parameters. These parameters were based on the knowledge we have on the orbit. As Walter stated, we have a 600 kilometer altitude. So at that low Earth orbit with the sun synchronous orbit, we were able to determine the time for orbit to be about an hour and 40 minutes. So using that time and the known altitude, we're able to solve for the maximum force that the satellite will go under. So you, that's what we want to target within our design. It was about 0.09 newtons. And for the actual magnet workers, we decided to use a soft iron rod as the core and a 40 gauge copper wire as the coil. Reason being their magnetic properties and because they are relatively cheaper, especially the core. Some cores go up in the hundreds and even thousands of dollars. And then to manufacture the torquer, since winding machines proves to be expensive, we created an apparatus with the drill where the rod would be attached to the head of the drill, a power drill. And by counting the amount of turns that it creates in an automated setting, in about 30 seconds, we can estimate how long to keep the drill on at that setting to get our desired number of turns. Um, we uh, established a design for various gauges of wire, various lengths, based on the voltage that's limited to the attitude control from the satellite. We allocated four volts of power to the satellite. So based on that and the length restrictions, we chose that the optimal design was the 40 gauge wire with about 7,000 turns. However, when we completed this, this torquer and then we tested it by applying a voltage, the current measure was very minimal compared to what we expected. So to reassure design, we retested it using a different gauge wire. And with that, we got a force output of 0 0.06 newtons, which is about 0 0.03 newtons off of what we decided to do. So we thought this was a lot more ideal. So this is going to lead to our final completion of the attitude control. Once we completed all of the subsystems and implementing the components, we decided it was important to actually test the satellite to make sure it could gather the data that we expected to. In addition, previously we have competed in the FunSat competition, 
and they've stated that although theoretically FIU has been sound, they've never actually shown results. So we wanted to make sure we had actual testing to be able to show concrete results. So what we wanted to do initially was have a tethered balloon launch, where using a helium weather balloon, we're going to hold the satellite using a rope and anchoring it to about 30 feet or so, and to see if we can get, collect all the necessary data. And here we see some of the data that the sensors were able to collect. Um, here we have a temperature and humidity in relation to the time. And when we compared this to the actual weather from, the, from other sources for January 26, we saw that our temperature was within about 5 degrees Celsius off of what the range was for the date. And that shows us that our sensors were accurate, especially considering they have an error of plus or minus 2 degrees Celsius. And next, we see additional data with temperature and time and a picture taken from the satellite while it was tethered. So although the tethered balloon led to successful results, we wanted to allow for more precision data. So for that, we needed to calibrate all the sensors. So to do this, we placed the satellite along with the sensors in various settings where we knew the, in various control settings, such as a 20 degree, sub 20 degree freezer, sub 80 degree freezer, and outdoors. That way we can assess whether the results we're getting is exactly what we expect. Here we have a sample results from the outdoor testing from the calibration. And from this, we see that one of the sensors is way off in comparison to the other ones. So this calibration actually helped us out because it figured out that one sensor was malfunctioning. And after calibrating, we wanted to do a final untethered balloon launch. And for this, we chose Nevada as the location. Nevada was chosen because of the weather conditions and the vast amount of empty land. Because we wanted to launch the satellite at about 30 kilometers, so we needed it to land securely in an empty space that we can retrieve it. So we chose Nevada for that reason. It's landlocked, there isn't any risk of it falling in the water, it's deserted, so we're not worried about trees or anything like that. So before actually conducting the launch, we had to do a lot of analysis to make sure we could actually not only do it, but be able to get the satellite back safely. So we needed to do force analysis to make sure it could land safely. We had to figure out the amount of helium required to lift the payload, how high we wanted it to go, the lifting time, and the location it was going to land based on the wind patterns of that day. Um, here we have a video of the actual launch itself. Um, on the satellite, make sure to note this, that we had a tracker on it, so we could actually follow it as it was moving along throughout its pattern. Um, it went up about 30 kilometers. We were able to follow it in the sky for a while, and after about a half hour, um, some of us could think they still saw it, but I couldn't see anything, so like a speck in the sky. So I took their word for it, but they were able to see it. It took about two hours for it to land, and then that concluded that testing. So to do all of this together, it cost about $1,800. Although this seems like a lot to us as students, when you consider that satellites, how much money it goes into it to gather all the data, this isn't that much at all, which is why CubeSats have risen in popularity. They're a cost-efficient way to gather the same amount of data. The budget for this was provided to us by the competition as we submitted a report and through the mechanical department here at Florida International University, along with some from ourselves. Um, here's a timeline of how the work and how the work has been allocated. Um, we started working on this in August, and we're still working on it as the actual competition is a two-year process, so it doesn't conclude until the spring next year. Um, Sergio has, was responsible for the optics, which he discussed, along with working with the power subsystem and manufacturing. I was responsible for the attitude control system, along with helping out with manufacturing and the power subsystem. And Walter, as you saw, was responsible for the thermal analysis, simulations of the structure, and manufacturing as a whole. And from all these various tasks, you can see how this is an interdisciplinary project. Building a satellite isn't just knowing mechanical engineering. You have to be able to test it in various ways. You have to be able to work with the electrical components. You have to be able to program it and to be and to know how to establish a communication link within the satellite itself. Um, these are some of the standards that we had to keep in mind while working on this. Um, the first two were mainly geared toward specifying how we're building the satellite and how we're testing it to make sure it's done correctly. The next three are mainly for environmental concerns. As sense CubeSats have become more popular, it's led to a lot more space debris and access to space, and we need to make sure we mitigate those. And the last one deals with the use of hazardous materials in space. As I said before, the actual competition is until spring of next year, so there's still a lot of work to be done. We, along with our mentor Pradeep Shindi, have established the Near Earth Explorer Cup here at FIU to keep working, to keep the fun side competition alive at FIU, and to further introduce um, satellites as a whole to the school. And um, yesterday we actually found out that we were among the finalists for the competition. 
So that means we have to next week go to Kennedy Space Center and give a 30 minute presentation on what we've had so far and go from there, which means a lot more manufacturing of the satellite with components, finalizing all the subsystems, finalizing the communications of solar panels, doing a lot more testing to make sure it works securely and it collects data we need. This project as a whole led us to gather an understanding of the importance of clear communication when working on a project. And although we had the help of Fresh Dose and Oakland, our mentor for deep, they made sure that we worked for everything we did in the satellite to gain the knowledge ourselves. Um, here are some of the references of the main references that we needed to complete this. And thank you for your time. Any questions? Yes. How did you get to Nevada? Oh, we flew. <laughs> yeah, because you were so casual about that. And then we went to the bus. No, 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 we flew. Yeah. With the uh, money we got from the Oh, that's great. Yeah. And it came and you found it two hours later? Like I know you launched it. And right, it we had a tracker, so yeah, yeah, we were tracking all the time. Tracking it. How far away was it from where you were? Like, it was like an hour and a half drive. Right? A drive an hour and a half away, yes. Wow. Yeah. Same <laughs> the bus. Yeah, yes. So a lot of empty small towns, deserted towns. Yeah. Were you able to find it pretty fast? I mean, I know you were tracking it. I know. Yeah, the tracker been... was in within two meters. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, it was a it was a very accurate tracker. We tested the tracker itself before putting it on the satellite. So within the hotel room, we moved it from the window to the bathroom, which is a distance of about five eight meters, mm -hmm. and it gave us a. a Text message telling us that it moved. And as we were driving to the testing site, the tracker was on. on and we're able to see from the app on our phone that it actually followed along with the map right. locations. <laughs> so we didn't blindly test the trusting tracker. We wanted yeah. to make sure it accurately gave the location. Yeah, because all the work you put into it and then launching it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to yeah. make sure you get yeah. it back. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, while you're doing that, were you able to test the you know, cameras? Right, all the information was recorded on SIM cards. That's what we obtained those pictures from the FAA testing. Right. <laughs>